We have one more presentation before lunch, and that's um, a presentation from my colleague Maureen Pennock, who's the head of digital preservation at the British Library. And she's going to be giving an overview of digital preservation. And the reason, um, one of the reasons why we've asked Maureen to give this presentation is, I think yet, uh, last week, Thursday, was World Digital Preservation Day. And also, um, it's, it's connected to our uh, performance, uh, which is taking place at the end of the day, which is all about the fragility of capturing things digitally. And will that last in 150 years' time? Um, I'm not sure Maureen can give us the answer to that question, but um, over to Maureen, and she's just going to give a quick overview of the work that they do. Hello, uh, welcome. Right, you'll be really pleased to know that I've only planned to talk for about 10 minutes because um, I'm aware that you know we're now eating into your lunchtime. Um, with a bit of luck, I'll make it a little bit less and, and we can go and start having a chat. I will be here over lunch if anybody wants to talk some more. So, without further ado, whenever I give a talk about digital preservation, I like to start with this slide because it gives the context for everything that we do. Um, our digital collections are really at the heart of what we do as a digital national library and as a digital preservation team. It's the reason we're here. And our digital collection is absolutely amazing. It's phenomenal. We have so many different types of content in there. You know, you've heard about a few of them already this morning, but there is so much more. It's phenomenally diverse um, and it's huge. We've got several petabytes um, of digital collection content comprised of millions and millions of unique files. We've got everything from digitized books and digitized manuscripts and digitized newspapers to born digital e-books and born digital e-journals. We've got cartographic and topographic data. We've got the Ordnance Survey data sets. We've got the uh, e-theses, massive collection of e-theses and metadata about e-theses. We've got the National Sound Archive. We've got the UK Web Archive. Uh, we've got digital musical scores, digitized and born digital. We've got the electoral registers. Uh, we've got uh, emerging formats even, content published in new forms such as eBooks published as mobile apps, conference proceedings, um, moving images. You know, the list goes on and on. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. But the question that we have to ask is how do we go about preserving all of this kind of content? Uh, what are the risks that we have to deal with in long-term digital preservation? How can we optimize workflows when we're operating at this kind of scale and this kind of diversity to make sure that what we do is cost-effective and is really efficient? Uh, what are the needs of digital content compared to analog content when it comes to preservation, <laughs> conservation and access? Who should be responsible for digital preservation in an organisation? And what kind of skills do you actually need to do digital preservation? What's the strategy? What's the policy? What's the system that you do all of these things in? You know, what are the challenges that we have to deal with? Well, fortunately, the British Library's had a digital preservation team since about 2005, so by now we, uh, we like to think we're quite well versed in understanding what the challenges really are. Um, we spell some of these out in our digital preservation strategy, which is available online. Um, and the strategy also talks a little bit about, obviously, how we will go about preserving our digital collections so that they're not just available for this generation of researchers, but so that they're available as well for every generation of researchers that comes after you. Let's talk about those challenges a little bit more. Some of you, I can see some smiles, some of you uh, will recognize this. Uh, this is a BBC Micro, so very, very popular computer in the 1980s. You would find these sometimes in classrooms across the UK, one per school kind of thing, um, and in some homes as well, but no longer. These are technologically obsolete. They're outdated. This technology has been vastly surpassed. Uh, it is no longer supported. And technological obsolescence is often considered as the greatest challenge in digital preservation. And this is because content is generally created to work on a particular environment, particular hardware or software operating system or application software. 
And then as your technology changes, it becomes increasingly difficult to make sure that you can still access your older content on your newer devices, at least in an authentic and reliable form. But that's actually just the long-term view. Now, it's very relevant for us because we're looking very, very long-term, and you can understand that this situation is compounded over time. But actually, there are many, many more challenges that we have to deal with as well in the very shorter term. Everything from uh, media integrity and bit rot to digital <coughs> rights management and metadata. So there's three kind of key areas that I'm going to very quickly <laughs> draw to your attention. Uh, areas of challenges for us. The first is the fragility of storage media. Storage media degrades. Um, tapes, discs, floppy disks, CDs, you know, they don't always last as long as we would want them to last for. And the degradation of this media can have sometimes quite catastrophic effects on the integrity of the file uh, and your ability to render the file on screen. This can happen uh, actually in a really short time period. It can happen with no notice um, and it can happen within a few years, sometimes less, um, of your files just being stored on the media in the first place. If you're interested in examples of how this can manifest, uh, take a look at a Twitter account called Flipbitbot, uh, which if you tweeted a picture, um, it'll flip a bit for you and send you back uh, the outcome. The outcome varies. Integrity and validation. Um, it's much easier to make unnoticed changes to digital content than it is to analog content. It's one of the beauties of working in a digital environment, at least insofar as actually developing our work goes, but it causes a challenge over the longer term. Um, just think how easy it is to move content around in a Word file. It's great, but we've got to kind of prevent that from being a problem in the future. Um, and things as well about changes that can occur when you move your file from one computer to another or when um, Microsoft Word asks you, hey, do you, we've got a new version of this, of this file format, would you like to upgrade? And you click yes and then it looks quite different <coughs> afterwards. These are all changes that can happen that can impact on the integrity of the content and that's an issue when it comes to reliability um, and reproducibility of the content for things like academic and scientific research, let alone just trying to read and experience an object. And fundamentally, what it comes down to is that these kind of challenges can manifest all the way throughout the life cycle. From the point at which we start thinking about acquiring content um, and getting it in to the point at which we get rid of it. What this needs is a really proactive life cycle based management approach to keep on top of all of these threats and issues that threaten the longevity and reliability of our digital collections over time for all of these different formats, for all of these different content types that we have in our collection. But digital preservation isn't just a technical challenge. Um, it does require this ongoing and typically recursive series of actions and interventions right throughout the life cycle to ensure continued reliable access to digital content for as long as it's deemed to be of value. But it's not just about technology, it's also about people, the people who figure out what to do and to do this work. It's about policy, it's about resources, um, it's about the collections, it's about research, uh, because we are always shooting at a moving target. Environments, technologies are constantly changing. Um, and digital preservation as a discipline, been around for about 20, 30 years, still really emerging, still an emergent discipline. And it's about a strategy. It's about a strategy that brings all of this together to make sure that we can provide persistent access over time. So our current digital preservation strategy um, is actually very much focused around um, the replacement of our digital repository system. Our current system is a four node replication system that we built and developed and maintain ourselves. We do it all in house. We've recently procured a new system called Libsafe. Uh, commercial system and we're in the process of working out how can we migrate our collections from one system to another um, and to make them more efficient, to make our workflows more efficient and provide access to more, more and more different types of digital content and make sure that we safeguard the bits and the integrity of the content as well throughout all of this. It's a great challenge, it's, it's fascinating stuff. But we've also got another uh, really cool thing that we're doing at the moment, and alongside LibSafe, we'll be running a platform called IPS. Um, IPS stands for Integrated Preservation Suite. 
And it's one of the products of our digital preservation research program here at the British Library. Um, it's a brand new system that will basically sit alongside LibSafe and it supports preservation planning at scale. It's designed to interface with any repository system, um, but it's comprised basically of a software repository, uh, a technical registry, a policy and a planning database, uh, and then a preservation workbench. And this allows us to respond to any technical risks that manifest. We can uh, develop a preservation plan to respond to that risk and mitigate it. And then we can implement that plan across the many thousands of millions of files that we need to, depending on the risk, so that we have reliable and ongoing access over time. It's an award-winning project, I'm very glad to say. Uh, we, uh, we won the IPRES Best Paper um, Award for this piece of work last year, um, just this year, last month. IPRES is the big international conference um, in digital preservation. And again, we're more than happy to tell you loads about this over the break if you're interested. But the other research project I just want to quickly introduce you to is called Flashback, because we like projects with cool names. Um, it's a great research project. Uh, it is a project to safeguard over 100,000 legacy disk-based items that the library acquired mostly before the turn of the millennium. A lot of them came in attached to the front of magazines or in the backs of books. Um, and this was before the digital preservation team. Um, now we're in the process of safeguarding all of that content, getting it off the disks, um, virus checking, checksumming, packaging it um, up in our imaging lab up in the north, and preparing it for ingest into the new repository system. In the future, hopefully not too distant, we'll be able to provide access to this content using a scalable emulation framework that we will roll out um, in our reading rooms. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. That's me done. So this has been a really quick um, introduction to digital preservation. There is so much more that I could have said, um, but I will be here over lunch along with one of my colleagues, Michael Day. Um, he will be here too. He's our digital preservation research lead. If you want to know more, come and find us. We are more than happy to tell you about it. Thank you. Thank you.